Good evening, everyone. I'm uh, Jennifer McCroy, the director curator at the Moose Jaw Museum and Art Gallery. I'm very pleased to um, welcome you all to the opening of three new exhibitions. They are Jude Griebel, Illuminated Collapse, Donna Claxton, and Prairie Dreaming, Folk, fun Folk Funk and Their Connections. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we're gathering on Treaty 4 territory, the traditional lands of the Blackfoot, Nehewak, Anishinaabe, Soto, Lakota, Nakota, Dakota, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. At the Moose Jaw Museum and Art Gallery, we recognize that museums and art galleries are part of a colonialist system where narratives and collection practices um, that are based in the colonial system have been foundations of these institutions. We're committed to decolonizing our institution by inviting and supporting Indigenous voices to lead and inform our programs, collections, and presentations of Indigenous art, history, and narratives, as well as making space for diverse voices from our community to co-curate and have their cultures and narratives reflected in our programs and exhibition content. I want to thank our funders, and they are the City of Moose Jaw, Sask Arts, the Government of Saskatchewan, the Saskatchewan Lottery, SAS Culture, Canada Council for the Arts, and the Government of Canada, as well as the Department of Canadian Heritage. I also want to thank our sponsors. Um, we, um, we have Temple Gardens Hotel and Spa and Sparrow Hawk Developments, who have sponsored the Dana Claxta exhibition. And uh, David Wood is here tonight um, to represent Temple Gardens. Can you give a wave? <laughs> Thank you. Um, this sponsorship will also support an upcoming artist talk with Dana Claxton and uh, Lakota historian Dr. Claire Thompson. The exhibition Dana Claxton features two works by the artist in the Moose Jaw Museum and Art Gallery's permanent collection, uh, which includes a video installation titled Sitting Bull and the Moose Jaw's Sioux, and a new acquisition to the collection, a, tr a photograph photographic triptych called Cabri Lake 123. The work of Hunk Papa Lakota artist Dana Claxton is critically acclaimed being based in film, video, photography, single multi-channel video installation and performance art. Her practice is known for its investigation of indigenous beauty, the body, the socio-political and the spiritual. Her work often alludes to the destructive legacy of colonialism while it also celebrates the resurgence of First Nations presence and contemporary identity, resulting in powerful, powerful works of great conviction and beauty. Claxton's works in the permanent collection speak to a spiritual connection with place and with the history of the Lakota people in Moose Jaw and Wood Mountain, the former being her childhood home and the latter her First Nation. The video installation work, work Sitting Bull and the Moose Jaw Sioux explores and celebrates the history of Sitting Bull and her own people's history being a descendant of Lakota women who walked to Canada with Sitting Bull. The video installation integrates multiple perspectives of that history through recorded interviews combined with her own footage and archival images of the late 19th and early 20th century Lakota camp established by Sitting Bull in the River Valley near Moose Jaw. The photographic trip to Cabri Lake 123 presents stunning images of land and sky that offer a quiet celebration of indigenous culture and a deep spiritual connection to the land. Dana Claxton's work has been shown internationally, including at the Museum of Modern Art and the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York and the Museum of Contemporary Art in City, Sydney, Australia. Her work is held in pu public, private, and corporate collections, including the National Gallery of Canada, the Vancouver Art Museum, the Mackenzie, the Remy Modern, the O'Dane Museum, Seattle Art Museum, and Minneapolis Institute of Art as well as the Newman Museum of Contemporary Art and the Moose Jaw Museum and Art Gallery. She's received many prestigious awards, including the Natitian Foundation Visual Arts Award in 2019, the Governor General's Award in Visual and Media Arts in 2020, the Scotiabank Photography Award also in 2020, and the Odeon Prize for the Visual Arts in 2023. Fringing the Crew the Cube, her solo survey exhibition, was mounted at the Vancouver Art Gallery in 2018. Uh, she is a professor and head of Department of Art History, Visual Art and Theory with the University of British Columbia. Uh, Claxton is a member of the Wood Mountain Lakota First Nation, located, located in southwest Saskatchewan and resides in Vancouver, Canada. 
Uh, Dana is unable to be with us here tonight, but we will have an online artist talk with her at a date to be determined, so please stay tuned. The exhibition Prairie Dreaming features works by prairie artists in, the, in our permanent collection to explore the shared motivations and inspiration of folk artists and artists such as Vic Sikansky, Joe Fafard, Russ Uristi, and David Thauberger, who were influenced by California funk ceramics. Featured in our lobby exhibition space, this exhibit features many new acquisitions to the collection thanks to donations from collectors that include Mary Ann Sikansky and Rod Tyler, who are also here tonight, uh, David Kim Jones, and David and Veronica Thauberger. Our third exhibition opening tonight is Illuminated Collapse by Jude Griebel. The exhibition presents a series of detailed dioramas merging figure and ground to highlight human connection to the surrounding world. In these sculptures, unsettling scenes unfold on the surface of circular bases. Anthropomorphic landscapes are engaged in dramatic acts of self-consumption and destruction, projecting a metaphorical end-of-times narrative. Mirroring our own world through their miniature elements, the works reflect on contemporary consumption, industrial development, and inherent environmental degra de degra de degradation. Thank you. G Griebel's artworks combine scientific reality with fantasy and diverse cultural references using personal symbolism and metaphor to register the concept of planetary collapse. So we're very pleased to have Jude here with us tonight um, to present on his work and um, I'll just introduce him. So Jude is um, a Saskatchewan-raised artist, and he works between Bergen, Alberta, and New York City. Uh, he completed an MFA in ceramics and sculpture from Concordia University, Montreal in 2014. He has an MFA in international exchange from the University of Lapland in Finland, and holds a BFA from Emily Carr University of Art and Design in Vancouver. He's completed, completed numerous residency, including Mass MoCA, North Adams, Massachusetts, the International Studio and Curatorial Program, Brooklyn, New York, the Hall 14 Center for Contemporary Art in Leipzig, um, Germany, and Pioneer Works in Brooklyn, New York. Recent exhibitions include uh, the Arts, is it Chayota? in Japan, the Art Gallery of Alberta, um, the just had an exhibition close at the Esker Foundation in Calgary, and uh, he's had work at the Beating Museum of Biodiversity in Vancouver, uh, Gallery Sturm in Nuremberg, and the Spinneray Archive Massive in Leipzig. Um, he is a recipient of grant funding from the Pollock Krasner Foundation as well. He is a three-time recipient of the Elizabeth Greenshields Foundation grant for emerging figurative artists. And his work is in collections including the Arsen Ars Arsenal Contemporary Art in Montreal, the Franz Masseril Centrum in Casterly, uh, sorry if I'm butchering, <laughs> and the Art Gallery of Swift Current. So here's Jude. Hello. Um, thanks, so com thanks so much for coming out to spend your Friday evening here at the museum uh, for the opening of uh, my exhibit as well as um, the other artists presenting tonight. I, um, I'm going to talk briefly about my work. Um, I'm glad to be able to show you some older work and speak a bit about the foundations of my work so you can better understand the exhibit uh, that's down below. And then um, after I do discuss it, it will be nice to go downstairs and I'm happy to answer any questions you have about the work. Great. Well, I like to uh, talk a little bit about my background when I'm speaking about my work because uh, the work um, follows a pretty clear path from my childhood forward, um, especially my prairie childhood. Um, I was raised between Saskatoon and a uh, family farm in central Alberta. And um, when we're young, we're usually uh, sort of taught pretty clear distinctions between landscape and uh, our body in various ways. But uh, growing up on the prairies, I was very preoccupied with th these borders in between the landscape and body and how they sometimes slip or merge. 
Um, you know, I was very interested in um, prairie craft and folk art um, as a young person, especially um, bodies built from um, natural materials, uh, things like snow people and wheat woven figures, um, figures uh, that have to do with crops and seasons, and uh, especially what it means to have uh, bodies built out of these materials, um, especially uh, being raised on a farm where you're seeing a lot of things being put into the ground, grown from the ground, and then consuming them, and feeling a lot more attached to these uh, cycles of growth and these um, cycles of the seasons. So when I first began making work, I was working flat, painting and drawing, and I was actually um, building ephemeral figures out of natural materials uh, that I was used to on the prairies, and then... Um, once I'd built these ephemeral figures, I would draw them or paint them, and that documentation would be the finished product that you would then see um, in the gallery or on a wall. But there became a really interesting point in doing this where um, all of a sudden the figures I was building out of these natural materials started holding a lot more psychological weight to me. Um, they were in my space. Um, I could move around them. They were casting shadows. And at that point, I really had to figure out how am I going to make these things more permanent how am I going to bring them indoors and move them around? Um, so I started exploring various materials at that point to try and do that. Um, and the only uh, experience I'd really had with sculpture, besides making these uh, figures out of ephemeral materials, was building my Halloween costumes as a child out of paper mache and then painting them. So that's exactly where I started my sculpture building, um, creating paper mache forms. Um, and really when I began making these works, which were quite prairie vernacular in nature, um, I was almost conceiving them as empty Halloween costumes or as empty costumes. They were sort of the same scale as my body. Um, I was working with my body around them, building them. And uh, so I was sort of thinking of them in that way. <clears throat> and I, was, uh, I didn't have a formal uh, sculpture background in terms of casting and carving. And so I was working with paper mache, slowly introducing other materials as uh, details. Um, so there is um, a real folk art quality to the work in terms of using a lot of uh, materials from my nature or from my immediate environment um, to speak to these memories of certain places. Um, the earlier work was quite prairie vernacular in nature. Um, a lot of it referenced agriculture, um, the idea of owning land and uh, producing crops on land. Um, in this piece here called Wheat Country, you're seeing this figure embodying, embodying a farmyard and a wheat field, um, sort of complacent, feeling tied down uh, to the history of this family land. And you can see a traditional farm weathering on one leg, and there's sort of a, an oil derrick pumping oil on the other, um, speaking to the, um, the uh, industry sort of moving in on this traditional um, way of settler life on the prairies. And another example here, it's this figure uh, sort of speaking to the seasons and passing time. Um, and so it's this figure embodying a family compost heap on a farm, uh, completely co composed of um, rotting fruits and vegetables and sort of passing time scrolling through its text messages. Yeah, and, and the work uh, often uh, began growing in scale as well. Um, still uh, sort of speaking to uh, farming on the prairies and food production. Um, this is a piece that was at the Art Gallery of Alberta uh, called Barn Skull. Uh, I'd been documenting the fronts of various barns when I was back on the prairies that were sort of fading and falling back into the ground. And uh, so this is at once uh, the front of my grandfather's barn and his aged face, uh, speaking to the sort of death of the small family farm in the wake of larger agribusiness on the prairies. Um, so then when I moved away from the prairies um, and began living um, in New York City, um, I started uh, looking at the landscape in a much broader scale um, in terms of um, sort of vast consumption and um, products being moved in from uh, various parts of the world and looking at the tides of trash going onto the street. So, um, and, and then digging back into um, the history of humans relating to the landscape in various imaginative ways as well. Um, so this is, the, uh, this is uh, one of the first landscape paintings known in Western history um, from 1528, where the landscape was being shown divorced from the body. So it was always, the, the body was always included and it was the back, or the landscape was always a backdrop um, for the body in various ways. So this is one of the first times we're seeing um, a strict landscape painting. 
And it was at that time when uh, figures were divorced from the landscape in Western art history um, during the Renaissance that uh, this sort of curious subgenre of uh, Renaissance painting emerged of these anthropomorphic landscapes. Um, artists like Mathis Marion the Elder and Athanasius Kircher were um, taking these landscape paintings and painting hidden bodies into them. And this was done uh, for a few reasons. It, and it's sort of something that's repeated over and over again. We see this uh, repeated almost like a, a meme of the um, 17th century. And uh, this was being done sort of out, out of grotesque whimsy, but also they were doing this really interesting thing where these artists, where they were painting their patrons into the land they owned, sort of a asserting human dominance over the natural world. And uh, this was really interesting uh, to me. And I started looking at these historic paintings and wondering how these landscape bodies would hold the weight of today's world, um, this hyper-developed world um, that we're constantly digging up and um, digging into um, and changing in various ways. So uh, my work took me forward to create these hybrid landscape bodies that were um, very tragic bodies uh, trying to hold the weight of um, our contemporary world and uh, jeopardized ecosystems. And we can see this motif, it sort of ripples through um, art history into pop culture, um, all the way um, into uh, contemporary uh, VR renderings. Um, so here's, here's an image of Nikki St. Fowles' um, tarot garden um, in Italy, uh, which is, again, um, born out of a grotesque Renaissance statuary that was in that area, sort of mirroring that in a more contemporary way. And at the same time as I began making these works, I was collecting this vast database of ruined bodies and environments uh, jeopardized by human industry and waste that I began sort of working from uh, to create these uh, tragic environment beings. Um, and also in living in New York, um, studios are always uh, in, in um, industrial areas uh, due to price. So uh, walking on the studio, documenting my walk each morning, um, crossing the Newtown Creek, which is the most polluted waterway in North America, and um, just sort of gathering images and documenting my immediate environment there. And uh, so also in looking at uh, in pop culture, um, how, how we embody a mess, you know, what does a mess look like? And looking at all these very uh, whimsical um, examples uh, from my youth, um, we're seeing um, Marjorie the Trash Heap, which appeared on Fraggle Rock, uh, who was composed of waste, but at the same time was a sort of a sage character giving advice about the world um, from their experience made of garbage. And so um, my resulting sculptures um, were these uh, figures sort of uh, composed of jeopardized landscapes and stepping out of them as well. Um, you're seeing here a piece from 2017 titled Offshore. And um, so this is a figure entirely composed of shells and sea life stepping out of a reef of plastic garbage and detritus. Um, and it almost looks like a um, one of the tourist uh, crafts you might see composed of shells if you were to stay at an all-inclusive resort somewhere. And uh, so this is, um, this is a figure composed of all that sea life, but stepping out of this uh, destroyed environment, perhaps looking for somewhere else. And um, at this point, too, you can see the material is really shifting. Um, so I'm um, using things like uh, a lot more wood as framework, um, a lot of air drying clays, which I'm modeling and then painting. And so that's, uh, that's what an, an exhibition of those works might look like. There's also a really playful shift in scale that's starting between very small works and quite large works, which is something I continually play with um, to this day. Um, I really like that the viewer has to sort of look up and uh, down at the work and into the work. So um, it's this really uh, playful way of moving through an exhibit and having to focus on small details and then having to step back and uh, look up at larger things above you. Um, this is another work titled Flight Path, uh, referencing our climate-driven fires. Um, so in this work, you're seeing a, um, a figurative fire uh, with sort of human features and the animals escaping along its arms, which just sort of narrow and end in more human development rather than natural habitat. 
And um, that's uh, what an exhibit of these works might like look like. Uh, this was at um, Musée Carmel de Pamiers in uh, southern France uh, this past summer. Um, and that sort of brings us up to the exhibit downstairs titled Illuminated Collapse. Uh, I made this work, this body of work, um, during a three-year residency in New York City. Um, and during that time, um, I'd been reading all these uh, articles um, about the doomsday clock, um, about the, um, the increasing uh, rate of planetary collapse. And I wanted to create works that address the situation, but um, I wanted them to be... Um, very transformative and imaginative, um, prioritizing a sense of uh, transformation and possibility over simple closure. And uh, it's a really huge um, subject to think about, and it's a subject that not a lot of people want to think about. So in this work, I, um, I really uh, worked a lot with the idea of the miniature and these miniature spaces. So these are almost like dioramic theaters that you can walk around and look into. Um, it's maybe something like you might see at a natural history museum. But the idea of the miniature, um, I think, worked really well for this project as well, because when you confront a miniature space, um, you can really project your mind into those miniature spaces and let your imagination wander before confronting the ideas that are being put forward. Um, and uh, because of the subject matter not being uh, something a lot of people like to consider or think about, I thought it was a really good access point for sort of starting conversations about these topics. Um, the spaces depicted in the works that you'll see downstairs are sort of um, anywhere at one time and somewhere, um, it, somewhere at the same time. They're often sites that I've been following um, and drawing over the years. Uh, there's cities based on um, city skylines I've looked at and drawn. Um, there's a suburb from Cochrane in one of the works that I've sort of uh, seen expand and develop over a foothill over numerous years. So um, although these seem like they could, could be strictly imaginary places, um, they really are tied into my personal history as well. Um, so there are this series of six dioramas and one larger work that accompanies the exhibit. And um, I won't talk about each one. You can go down and spend time with them in the gallery, but I just wanted to talk about a few uh, to sort of break down my thinking around them a little bit. Um, so in this, in this piece called Gaining Ground, um, you're seeing this figure uh, embodying a busy city uh, scape where the only green space is a graveyard. And um, this is based on the Cavalry Cemetery in Queens, New York, which is uh, somewhere I spent a lot of time walking through and by. And it is an actual, um, it is an actual graveyard surrounded by multi-lane freeways. Um, and it became a really um, apt symbol of an overcrowded and burdened world to me when I first moved to that area, because there's this, um, the only green space is um, full of little... Uh, Graves competing for space, uh, f filled with um, boxes with little bodies, and it's surrounded by this traffic, uh, this dense traffic of cars and trucks, which are all little boxes containing bodies vying for space on the road. So this figure is sort of uh, carrying the brunt of this. You can see that it has qualities of a commuter in traffic, tired eyes, and it's holding up a disposable coffee cup. And the only places to get off this circuit highway are a big box store or the graveyard or the gas station. <laughs> and so when I'm creating these as well, uh, they all begin from drawings. So um, drawing is still a really key part of my practice. I um, might create 35 or 40 drawings um, of the same sculpture, working out a lot of the ideas. And then it becomes time to uh, figure out how I'm going to push this into three-dimensional space how it's going to um, hold gravity in different ways, but also how it's going to be organized to come apart for shipping things like this around. So there's a lot of um, organization that goes into it. Um, there's uh, all the little details you're seeing are hand carved. Um, it's also often a case where I could do something like uh, purchase model components from a model store and insert them. But for me, it's really important to have my hand in all these small details and to carve and render them. Um, so it's, it just becomes part of the storytelling and part of the finished illusion. And it's also really important for me to, um, you know, if I'm thinking about um, mass amounts of uh, prefabricated objects like cars or housing, um, that I uh, understand that with my hands, even if it's a repetitive action of doing it again and again and again. Um, also, when I'm creating these works, um, 
I'm also uh, very aware that I'm an active consumer in this world um, and that these works uh, will become active consumers in the world themselves. Um, I'm very aware that every material you use has a footprint, um, that these works will be created and packaged and shipped places, taking up fuel um, and energy being lit and temperature controlled. So it is a real bind that I find myself in. And um, I often just have to think that the message um, might transcend the material in some ways, and that would be the hope. But I'm also um, always looking for newer materials to use um, with less of a footprint, um, trying to balance that in various ways. Uh, yeah, so here you can see um, some of the uh, detail of this work. Um, so uh, creating them, it really is being like being immersed in this miniature space. And so you can see here um, some studies I might have taken of traffic and then uh, how these things are sort of crafted and put together. So um, there really is a, um, a, a high craft quality to the work uh, in terms of this um, repetitive making with my fingers and cutting. And uh, sometimes they take three and a half to four and a half months to make an individual piece working with assistants. And then here, before these pieces go together, they almost come like giant model kits uh, that have to be assembled on site. Um, so this sort of brings us up to the pandemic. <laughs> this uh, work that you're seeing downstairs was all made between uh, 2017 and 2019. And um, collecting these images of a uh, ruined and compromised environment, uh, it, it really weighs on me psychologically, um, especially looking um, at, at uh, topics like species extinction and, um, and uh, the effects of that. And so during the pandemic, um, it, I sort of had to pivot a bit because um, the, I was finding the subject matter too weighty and I felt like I needed to pivot a bit to focus on what might occur after this sense of collapse. So looking at, um, I began creating another uh, image bank of um, past uh, visualizations of futures, of um, new ecologies taking shape, everything from um, antique sailing maps of imagined worlds, historic sailing maps, to uh, pulp 60s and 70s sci-fi novel covers, um, all the way up to sort of current VR renderings. So I was looking at all these images and considering them. And um, at that time during the pandemic, I'd just begun a long-term residency at Pioneer Works, which is a museum and art center in New York. And um, my, they had brought me in um, as a resident artist to uh, focus on creating a new large-scale sculptural installation work. And um, the museum is located in an area of Brooklyn called Red Hook, which is under the Brooklyn Queens Expressway, which is, again, a very... Uh, hard industrial area that's completely paved over. And one thing walking to the museum each day when I was sort of designing this installation that was really interesting me was that there are all these extermination businesses down there. Um, these businesses that are dedicated to wiping out the only species that are able to thrive in that paved over environment. And so I knew I wanted these species considered nuisance species to be the sort of key players in this installation I was building. Um, I was looking at a lot of things like these, um, like the uh, these antique engravings by L. M. Budgeon and J. J. Granville, who were um, whimsical illustrators during the Victorian era, which was an era um, where um, the uh, sort of new world of um, insects and cells were being discovered through microscopes and had really entered the popular imagination. Um, People, people discovering these new worlds that were existing around them through this new technology and it playing into popular culture. And I was also, um, as you've seen in past images I've shown you, really um, looking at uh, narratives that affected my developing imagination as a youth. Uh, this being um, Roald Dahl's 1961 book, James and the Giant Peach, where this group of despondent insects sort of uh, leave humanity looking for a better place to coexist. And also, um, the year I began this work was the 30th anniversary of Earth Day, and I was looking at all these archival Earth Day images of uh, students celebrating for the first time. Um, this is in Denver, a student parade, but just how it was a, such a jubilant event. Um, everyone seems so happy um, because they, they're uh, in believing that there's going to be transformation and change taking place. And so um, I wanted, uh, for this installation, I wanted these various uh, pervasive species, considered nuisance species, 
to be uh, forming this sort of parade or procession over a collapsed world, uh, symbolizing a new ecology taking shape. So I began creating these, um, working with these various species. Um, I chose six, including this cockroach, which I had found on the, in the basement of my building um, there and drawn through a microscope. And um, I'm sure um, some of you can relate uh, during the pandemic, finding that your worlds had really shrunk. And um, I was really excited to start noticing things that were all around me that I hadn't paid much attention to. Um, so I, for instance, I drew this cockroach through a magnifying glass and then just inflated the scale. I wanted these to be really monumental. And so uh, sort of here's the work sort of developing in my studio um, in New York. Um, so I wanted, yeah, I wanted these various weed and insect species to uh, sort of be towering above the viewer, uh, forcing them to, forcing their bodies and presences to be acknowledged in various ways. And so there's uh, one of the finished pieces. Um, this, uh, the, the final installation is called Next World Emissaries. And um, there, these uh, inflated insects and uh, weeds are all holding small offerings and parading over this collapsed world that's at their feet. Uh, yeah, and then so you can see it uh, installed. This is at the Illingworth Care Gallery in uh, Calgary at the Alberta University of the Arts. And uh, so they're forming this procession through the space. Um, here it is again at the Holter Museum of Art in the States. Uh, one of the, the blue bottle fly has an Earth Day sign that was taken from that parade of young people. <laughs> um, and so uh, following that work, um, I've been looking back at a lot of historical material again um, of sort of gathered bodies. Um, you know, there was once a time um, in painting where... Um, Bounties from nature uh, seemed like this uh, endless resource and were celebrated in um, painting and in popular culture, um, sort of uh, a vast wealths of uh, bodies from the sea or from the hunt. And I started check, uh, collecting a lot of historic images of uh, sort of gathered bodies. I'm sure some of you are familiar with this image of buffalo bones uh, from, uh, from the States, 1892. Um, so very uh, trying to understand the uh, the vast number of uh, lives um, killed or collected um, through these uh, through these assemblages of um, or these dumping grounds, um, and I also spent uh, I did a small residency at the Royal Ontario Museum, sort of documenting all of their natural history um, storage. So looking at all these little bodies that have been collected and just sort of exist in drawers, um, sort of out of the eye, um, just uh, sort of in limbo. Um, and then uh, last year, as research for this work, I was also um, in residence at the Toyosu Market in Tokyo, which is the largest uh, seafood market on the planet. Um, here you're seeing their tuna auction. So these are this happens four days a week, and these are all giant tuna on the ground, uh, which are shipped there, uh, often from Canada. They're auctioned off four days a week, and then they're shipped back to cities in Canada or North America in foam. So there's this huge footprint. Um, so I was docu documenting this collection of bodies and then the subsequent waste that was um, plowed away at the end of each day. Um, you can see those little caps on the fish are chunks of their tail that have been cut off so people can feel and look at the color of the meat. But it's like a fish football field of these giant fish each morning. And so I started, um, I started uh, creating all these small bodies um, during residencies, uh, carved and modeled. And um, I wanted uh, to create these heaps of bodies and landscapes, almost like uh, an entire ecosystem had been swept aside and just placed in a big pile, um, swept aside for development. So I began uh, by crafting hundreds of these small uh, bodies and then painting them. And uh, here you can see the sculptures taking shape. Uh, this is all clay and wood interior of these bodies being uh, built up and structured. Um, these were hugely laborious to make <laughs> and then paint. And then uh, sort of this is what uh, the finished works look like. So um, it's uh, sort of pushing the idea of all these um, of all these uh, species consumed or eaten or harvested uh, or hunted it sort of into the consciousness of the viewer. And the, um, the perspective really travels from the bottom up to quite small to sort of um, make them seem um, 
larger scale than they are. Uh, yeah, so that's another one developing in the studio. Yeah, and then that's sort of the finished work. Um, so I've been creating these uh, for the past uh, year and a half, but they take roughly one year to finish one, uh, working with assistants again. So it's a huge uh, amount of work for me. Um, but uh, I'm completing one right now that's uh, nine feet in scale, to give you an idea. And then looking again uh, at the sort of the um, unacknowledged animal life within our um, institutional system and factory food system. Uh, here you're seeing a piece uh, from 2020 called Procession, where various factory-raised animals are leaving factories, factory farms on the back of this piece, and uh, walking around this figure that's embodying a city, uh, walking around its arms sort of into the maw of the city. And so I've been... Uh, I've been visiting a lot of uh, abattoirs and factory farms, which is a, a really uh, difficult practice <laughs> for me, uh, spending time in these spaces. But um, really, uh, it, it is really important to the work uh, for me to be in these places and uh, feel them before making it. And uh, also looking at these sort of garish mascots for the fact fast food industry that sort of um, allow us to uh, not think about the animals that are the reality behind the product and the circumstance of their lives. Um, and this is other research looking at uh, crafted meat throughout history. Um, I, I collected a lot of crafted meat that was early displays for butcher stores. And um, then in Japan last year as well, I went to... Uh, visit this factory that was producing hyper-realistic uh, fake meat for restaurant display, uh, down to the point where this is all hand-painted and there are uh, beads of moisture on it. Um, so this is um, their, some of their fake meat products, uh, an actual grocery store of plastic meat. And um, this is sort of a sneak peek of my exhibit opening in New York next week. Uh, the, the exhibit is titled Revenants. And so I wanted to give these um, unacknowledged animal bodies um, some agency. So they're sort of walking away from the plates in their prepared states. Um, this one's, yeah, 75 inches, so it's about seven feet tall. So again, uh, really confronting the viewer and in the space of the viewer, forcing you to think about the circumstances of their lives in various ways. Uh, yeah, so there's like a steamed prawn holding a lemon wedge and a, a shucked oyster. And uh, this uh, pig that's been put back together with the sausages, it's sort of been made into. So um, they're kind of grotesque and they're kind of whimsical, um, but they're, uh, they're, um, they really force the viewer to sort of uh, consider their consumption habits and uh, to recognize this as an animal rather than a product. And... Um, because I don't like these talks to be too doom and gloom, I often uh, end with this image of um, Mount Taramaki in New Zealand, um, which is a site that's sacred to the Maori people um, who consider it an ancestor. Um, and it's really interesting in the way that um, this uh, protected mountain has uh, just been awarded human rights in New Zealand. And I really like that idea um, after creating these landscape figures of a landscape being awarded uh, human rights and uh, treated as a being in itself. So I thought that was sort of a happy note to end on after um, all the doom and gloom I put you through. Yeah, and um, thanks very much for coming. And uh, if anyone has any questions, I am happy to answer them now, or I'll be in the gallery and can talk to you in person then. Thank you. Oh, thanks everyone. Um, if, if there are no questions for Jude, I just had one question for you, Jude. I wondered if you could talk about the influence of folk art um, in your work. <clears throat> uh, yes, certainly. Um, yes, uh, folk art has played um, a big role in my work uh, growing up on the prairies. Um, I. Uh, my family knew a lot of prairie folk artists, and so I spent time seeing them work and, um, you know, spent time seeing their studios, which was really interesting for me as a child to sort of not only uh, know the person and see the work, but get that glimpse into their workspace and the sort of small worlds they were creating there. Um, especially in terms of uh, Saskatchewan folk art, um, 
I was really interested in the work of Dimitris Strychak, uh, who has a piece hanging up in the Prairie Dreamers show downstairs. Um, and um, I knew him quite personally, and uh, he had this really eccentric, uh, wonderful way of working that involved all sorts of materials uh, from his immediate surroundings, like popsicle sticks and lipstick and uh, collaged paper and foil. And um, so just as a young person, having that sense that um, art could be created from anything in your immediate surroundings uh, to reflect another place entirely um, really stuck with me and has been an important part of my building. Um, my uh, sculpture practice is um, born more out of uh, things like model making and miniatures and diorama building than it is out of um, what a lot of people would be considered high art sculpture. Uh, so um, having access to seeing people um, actively create work like that as a child was really important to me here in Saskatchewan. And it's nice to have the exhibit up beside uh, Prairie Dreamers, which um, is showcasing a lot of Saskatchewan folk art. Thank you very much for coming. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Um, thanks, Jude, so much for presenting tonight. Thank you for um, sharing your work with us in the exhibition downstairs. And so I hope you all have time to spend looking at the work. Um, and congratulations on your show. Thank you. Um, I th want to thank our staff. Uh, we've got Jen and Vincent, Christy, and Rob Boss. Um, they've gone to so much hard work putting together the shows and tonight. Thanks to uh, Pat Aldred, our vice chair and our board, and Wendy Parsons for ha helping with the catering uh, today. And um, thanks again to Temple Gardens and uh, Sparrowhawk Developments for... Um, for sponsoring the Dana Claxton Show. And thanks to all of you for coming out. And please come uh, join us downstairs for some food and drink and conversation. Thanks mm. so much. I just wanted to add a thanks, too, to all the staff here and uh, to Jen and Jennifer for organizing this exhibit and bringing it here. It's been a terrific experience, and um, it's been really nice to be back in Saskatchewan and have the work here. <laughs>